Hello and welcome to Game Sack. That's right, we're back with the regular episodes once every two weeks, and this time we're talking about the PlayStation 2. That's right. We've gotten a lot of requests to do this episode, and we figured this would be a great time to do it. Yeah. So uh, why don't we, as usual, turn this to Joe to give us a breakdown of the system. Let's check it out. The Sony PlayStation 2. Released in the futuristic year of 2000, the PlayStation 2 was Sony's second highly successful console. It was the first video game console to use DVDs for media and it helped usher the format into homes as it was the first DVD player for many people. Many games were actually on the CD format which can be identified by their blue undercoat. Included was the DualShock 2 controller which added pressure sensitive buttons which fortunately were not used very much. The system could be displayed and used either horizontally or vertically, though some people do report increased read errors and scratch CDs when used in vertical mode. Later on, a network adapter was sold which allowed for online play as well as the installation of a hard drive. In 2004, Sony introduced a slimline model PS2 which was significantly more compact, features a flip top lid as well as built-in internet jacks. The PlayStation 2 runs on a 294.9 MHz CPU called the Emotion Engine and features 32 MB of RAM. The GPU clocks in at 147.4 MHz, features 4 MB of its own RAM and can push 66 million polygons per second. The PS2 was a juggernaut with nearly 4,000 officially released games. It's also the best-selling video game console in the history of forever, clocking in at over 155 million units sold. Highest-selling console, yeah, I, I can see that, but I'm, I'm curious, do you think any of those were because of the discrete error problems that the system had, that maybe people just had to rebuy the console again? Does that fluff up those numbers? Oh, I think it does. <laughs> I too. think it definitely does. Anyway, we've got lots of games to check out, so let's just get right on into it. Klonoa saw a sequel on the PS2 in the form of Klonoa 2, Lunatee's Veil. Vale. This is another really good entry into the series that doesn't stray far from the first game in terms of gameplay. Sure, the story is completely different, but to be honest, I was skipping the story just after the second or third cutscene. Firstly, because it started out completely uninteresting. Secondly, because the cutscenes seemed to drag on a lot longer than they needed to, and the character voices are pretty annoying. Again, as far as gameplay, this one is right up there with the first. Clonel controls the same, which is great. He can also grab enemies and use them to gain more height during a jump, and it basically acts like a double jump. He can also use these guys that he's grabbed to kill other enemies or open eggs for hidden items like hearts which refill your life bar. The levels are all really fun to play and retain the 2D gameplay with 3D backgrounds. Each level has multiple paths you can take so keep your eye open for what might be a branching path. Thanks to the awesome power of the PS2, the graphics look great and each level feels different from the next. Overall this is a great exclusive to the system and I'd recommend that you get this one if you don't already have it. Metal Gear Solid 2 was exclusive to the PS2 for about a year. It was then released as Substance on the PS2 along with the Xbox and PC. There's a huge storyline going on in this game with many twists and turns and if you're not paying attention then you're gonna get lost. In fact, there's so much story being told through cutscenes and dialogue that you'll sometimes feel that playing the game is secondary to watching the story unfold. I've missed many parts of the story because the cutscene has dragged on for 20 minutes or more and I couldn't hold the urine in my bladder any longer and had to go relieve myself. The gameplay is just like the first as you want to try and be sneaky and get past all the enemies if possible without them noticing you there. I'm not good at that so I just shoot them with the M9 and put them to sleep. A few new things have been added which really helps the gameplay. The most notable for me was the inclusion of a first person mode. This made killing bad guys a lot easier and more fun. I still get uneasy feelings playing this game knowing that any second I could get caught. The music really helps add to this with its suspenseful feeling that something's gonna happen. Some of the FMV cutscenes have Dolby Digital 5.1 surround sound, but gameplay is in regular old pro logic. All in all, it's easy to see why this game is ranked as one of the best games in the entire PS2 library. It has great action, a long detailed story, and really good graphics and music. However, it also has Raiden who will be the character you spend the large majority of the game playing instead of Solid Snake. It's definitely not a deal breaker though.
Not including the racing titles, Jack and Daxter had a trilogy of games on the PS2. At this point, Naughty Dog had proven themselves as a quality developer with the Crash Bandicoot series. The Jack series would prove to be another very strong trilogy. I've already talked about Part 2, so here's the first entry titled The Precursor Legacy. This game is a very solid action platformer. You control Jack on your quest to fulfill silly tasks by the people around him. Even though they seem like lame tasks, you'll still have a fun time playing. The graphics are pretty amazing with very lush landscapes and bright colors. The game has a day and night cycle which just adds to the atmosphere. One of the highlights is the interaction between Jack and Daxter. Jack doesn't talk at all, and Daxter won't stop talking. I found myself really enjoying all the one-liners that Daxter spits out throughout the game. Step one, stay alive. Even when you collect a power cell, Daxter has some really funny animations. These types of things are what gives a game its own identity and Naughty Dog definitely delivered. This game also has a widescreen option, which is nice. When you think about the PS2, I imagine the Jack and Daxter series would be one of the first sets of titles that come to mind, and rightly so, as it's one of the highlights for the system. Urban Rain is a cool beat-em-up by Namco that people don't talk about much. It turns out that the city is overrun with gangs and crime. You play as Brad Hawk, a hired thug who's gonna clean up the streets. And you do a pretty damn good job of it, too. Your main attacks are your strike and your grapple. You'll also be able to do cool attacks like running up walls and the such. Then, of course, are your special attacks. You have a gauge for this right underneath your life bar and it drains each time you use it but it refills during the course of normal battle. The game is pretty damn fun and you usually only fight a few punks in each stage. After you win each stage, you get a chance to power up an attribute or two of your choice. Usually between stages, you'll have a map so you can play these missions in any order you'd like. Unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be a whole heck of a lot of different locations and you'll fight in the same places a lot. Sometimes after a stage ends, I find my hands and thumbs hurting a little bit from how hard I was pressing on the controller. It can get pretty intense. The game is pretty fast paced and I'm pretty sure it uses the Tekken engine for its graphics. I mean they're pretty good and they run at 480p and in widescreen. I feel it could have used a bit more color though, but that's not really a big deal. I do like what this game has going for it. Check this one out, it's exclusive to the PlayStation 2. Yakuza is a franchise from Sega with a pretty good sized cult following. The first game here was released in 2005 and is often called the spiritual follow-up to Shenmue. I don't know about that. You play as Kazuma who is part of an evil criminal family. You start out by doing small errands, but it doesn't take long before you take the rap for killing your boss and serve time in prison for a crime that you didn't commit. Freeze! After 10 years you get out and try to piece together everything that's been going on during your incarceration. The main portion of the game is free roaming, kinda sorta. You generally can't go very far in any direction. The angle of the screen often switches and I found this to be unnecessary and even a little annoying. And you can't talk to every single person like you can in Shenmue, only those with a green triangle over them. You can enter a few shops and buy things like food and whatnot. Often you'll be forced into a battle, but you can get into others if you want to earn cash and experience. I really like that you can upgrade your skills with that experience. But really, what makes this game good is the story. You can see where it's going from 100 miles away, but that doesn't mean it's not enjoyable. This is the thing that keeps bringing me back to the game. The graphics are kind of average, but at least there's a widescreen option. The game doesn't have much music, and it feels kind of empty as a result, but the music that is here is fairly good. There's even a Dolby Digital 5.1 surround setting, but only the cutscenes used. It's kind of like Metal Gear Solid 2. Overall, not a bad effort, but nowhere near as good as Shenmue. Shit. Yakuza 2 came out in 2008. This one's pretty much more of the same with only a few changes. First off, there's no longer any English voices, which honestly is fine by me since it was pretty bad in part one. Secondly, the fighting engine is much more responsive. The story is cool. This time, it's all out war between the clans. Many characters return and of course you're gonna encounter a whole bunch of new ones as well. The graphics still don't do much for me, honestly. And despite that the box indicates progressive scan, this one only runs in crappy interlaced mode. 
At least they fixed the map so that when you play in widescreen it's now a circle instead of a stretched oval like it was in the previous game. These games are good, but really they aren't like Shenmue at all except that you can sometimes play arcade games and the such. And the arcade games in this world are kinda bad. All in all, I prefer this one over the original. Rygar, The Legendary Adventure was released in 2002. This is a new game in the series and not a remake of the original, although some of the enemies and of course the disc armor are all similar. As you'd expect on the PS2, the game takes place in a 3D world. This works well for the most part, but it does have a few problems. The main problem comes from the camera, which is fixed. This can be annoying because there's several times when you transition from one screen to the next, and when you're pushing one direction to go forward, and all of a sudden the same direction makes you go backward on the next screen. Also, being a fixed camera, your character can get really small once he goes into the distance, and the camera doesn't follow him. Other than that, I have no real complaints about the game. It controls just fine, and the new 3D environments are really fun to play through. The cool thing that I liked about this game back when it was released is that a lot of the backgrounds were destructible. I used to just run around destroying walls and pillars just for fun. As in the first game, you have your disc armor which is both your weapon and your shield. There are three different types that you can collect throughout the game. Each one has its own ability and you can even summon a creature to help you with an attack. The music is good and it actually makes you feel like you're in an epic adventure. At the time of this review, this game is super cheap so I highly recommend getting it as I've had a blast playing it. Shadow of Rome is another exclusive game for the PS2. Set in BC Rome, Julius Caesar has just been assassinated. You control two people. The first is a Roman centurion named Agrippa whose father is accused of the assassination. Of course, Caesar's assassination was a plot by the Senate and they wrongly accused Agrippa's father. The other character is Caesar's nephew, Octavianus, and no, he's not a butthole. Being that you control two people, there are two different types of playstyle. Firstly, Agrippa being a centurion is all about the battle. It's up to him to win fights as a gladiator and a soldier. Octavianus doesn't fight, but he plays a stealth role. It's up to him to infiltrate the Senate and other places to figure out what's actually happened. He's not totally defenseless and will sometimes need to take out people by choking them and other means to get the information he needs. The game plays fairly well on both fronts. The stealth scenes were a bit more difficult for me than the action scenes, but in time I was able to get how the game flows. Overall, the game looks good. I like the graphics for the most part. There's a few spots that seemed a little bland and colorless, but there were a few and far in between. And of course, the voice acting is terrible. I couldn't even save my own mother. I'm not sure how popular this game is, and I rarely see it out in the wild, but if it looks like something you would enjoy, by all means, go for it. Here's Blood Will Tell by Stupid Sega. This game is based on the famous manga series Dororo. For once, I actually really enjoyed the story. You play as Hayaki Maru. Before your birth, you were chosen by the Heaven Gods to be the one to rid the world of Demon Gods. The Demon Gods, finding this out, corrupted your father to let them have you. There's 48 demons in this game and each one has taken a piece of your body. You're saved by a doctor and he performs surgery on you and gives you swords for arms and a cannon in your leg. Now it's up to you to find the 48 demon fiends and collect the missing pieces to your body. As you start the game, it's all in black and white. The second demon you slay gives you back your eyeball. After this, everything turns to color. And you're not alone in your quest. A nagging little thief named Dororo follows you and actually helps you out in battle. There's many times that you actually take control of Dororo and uses sneaky skills to find out information for you. Overall, the game is great fun to play and the hack and slash fighting doesn't get super annoying like other games out there. Graphically, the game looks really nice on the PS2. I wonder what it would have looked like on the Dreamcast. <laughs> we'll never know. But I do have one complaint about this game. It has a fixed camera, and again, this can sometimes be a huge pain in the ass. Like here, where you're running towards the screen. You know there's an enemy coming up, but you have to actually run into them before you can see them. This is not good. Otherwise, this is a fun game, and I don't think that it's widely known, as I never hear anybody talking about it. If you see it at your local thrift store, buy it.
There's lots of Ratchet and Clank games, so let's take a look at Ratchet and Clank going commando. This is the second game in the series. Ratchet and Clank are relaxing after saving the day in the last game when suddenly they're called into action by the head of Megacorp. You need to retrieve an experiment that's been stolen. You take control of Ratchet and Clank eventually goes and gets himself kidnapped. Ratchet's main form of attack is his giant ass wrench. He can also throw it for long range attacks. You can buy new weapons and even level them up. The game's currency is nuts and bolts and you get it by killing enemies or smashing boxes. Be careful of the red boxes though as predictably they'll explode. You'll be getting lots of items to use throughout the game, all of which are selected by holding down the triangle button. As a 3D platformer, it's mostly well made and fun to play. The camera usually guides itself, but you can recenter or rotate it if you need, and you're gonna need to do that a lot. This one even has shooting scenes in, in space. 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 space! Here is where you collect rare titanium, which is only slightly less ridiculous than unobtainium. I like these space battles, they're pretty fun to play. Most stages have multiple tasks that can be completed. The graphics aren't bad, but the colors do seem kind of muted, and that was the case on many games in that era. 480p is supported, as is widescreen, so that's cool. For some reason though, this game starts to give me motion sickness after about an hour of playing. I don't know what it is, if it's the way the camera moves or what, but it happens. Still overall, it's not a bad game and there's a lot to do here. Firefighter FD-18 from Konami is one that I've never heard anyone really mention. You play as a firefighter and it's your goal to rescue all of the trapped people on any given stage. Thankfully, you have a fire hose with infinite length and it never gets tangled on anything. You also have an axe to bust through obstacles. The game is pretty intense. Now don't try to put out all the fires because that's impossible, just focus on rescuing the people. Be careful though because just like real life, some of the fires have life bars. Once you defeat these fire demons, the fire in your immediate area is pretty much out. Despite being pretty fun overall, I do have a couple of complaints. First is the camera. I set it in the options screen to be like I want, but it doesn't stick to the actual gameplay. There's no way to change it during gameplay and I simply cannot get used to it. Secondly, a lot of areas require that you switch to the axe to bust your way through. This is annoying because you need to press select to go into the inventory screen, pick the axe, go back out, then repeat the process to get back to your hose. And this gets old real fast. But otherwise, this is a really fun overlooked game. Check it out. Odin Sphere is a really cool 2D action game from Vanillaware. You play as Princess Gwendolyn who is on a mission to impress her daddy as well as die in battle to join her sister. The action takes place on looping stages, most of which have multiple exits. The action is straightforward but still fun and there's lots of different moves you can do. There's also special attacks which help out a lot. This game reminds me a lot of Princess Crown on the Saturn. Vanillaware made this one before they were officially Vanillaware. Both of them have similar female characters and both of them have item wheels with items that work in a similar fashion. However, Odin Sphere focuses much less on the RPG aspects. Yes, there is alchemy in this game where you mix this and that and you get a new item. I generally don't like this in games, but here it's pretty simple to deal with. The biggest problem is that you can't carry as many items as you'd like. Nowhere near as many. Each stage is pretty short, but there's a bunch of them in each chapter. You can see where each of the exits lead on the map if you found it. As you can see, the graphics are absolutely amazing with many layers of parallax scrolling. This game would really benefit from being in 480p, but we have to settle for interlacing only. The music is pretty damn good as well. You can always get one of the HD remasters of the game on the PS3, PS4, or Vita, which of course were only released in Japan. Sadly, they're not in English. And if you like vanilla wear, there's Grim Grim Wire, which is a real-time strategy game. In fact, it reminds me of various tower defense games in the way that it plays. Unfortunately, this game is hindered by the world's slowest and most boring tutorial imaginable. But the graphics, music, and gameplay are all excellent. I just wish I could skip through all the days of tutorials that this one throws at you and just learn on my own. 
I really, really hate forced tutorials. It makes me feel like I'm in school again, and I hated school. God, I sound like a six-year-old. But I mentioned this game here just in case you live for tutorials and didn't know about this one. If you can get past it, you'll have a great RTS game with vanillaware quality presentation. Okay, fine. The super popular Sega CD game Sylphid got a sequel on the PS2 titled Sylphid The Lost Planet. This game is a vertical shooter and kinda sorta feels like the original but mostly feels like a new game altogether. Game Arts and Treasure really took use of the power of the system to make a fun game. This was brought over to the US by Working Designs and got a few modifications over the Japanese version. They added analog control and fixed a lot of slowdown, both good additions in my opinion. And of course being a treasure game it's loaded with boss battles and you have at least three of these per level. Your ship can have two weapons at a time and you can fire these independently with the square and circle buttons or you can fire them both at the same time with the X button. I'm not sure why you would ever fire them separately but the option is there if you want it. What's really weird and I miss it is that there's actually no sub weapon or bomb here. After each level you'll gain a new weapon that you can equip to your ship. Halfway through each level you'll refuel your ship which will actually refill your life. At this time you can also switch your weapons if you want which is great in case the ones you've equipped aren't getting the job done. Visually the game looks great. All the backgrounds are detailed, but unfortunately they lack a lot of color. Not all of them are like this, but more than I care for. At times this game feels like it wants to be a bullet hell shooter as some of the bosses lay it on pretty thick. This is where I start to fail as my old brain can't figure out the patterns quickly enough to avoid being hit. Still I have fun playing this one and it's definitely worth the cheap price that it's currently going for at the time of this review. Here's Ape Escape 2, the sequel to the first game which was on the PlayStation. You're at it once again trying to collect apes that have gotten loose and are wearing the thinking caps. This time around the main character has changed to this kid. Yeah, the guy that had plastic surgery to remove his nose. I mean why else would he have a bandaid where his nose was? As with the first game you slowly gain a number of gadgets that'll help you catch those slippery little bastards. I mean it, those damn monkeys get very hard to catch the further into the game you get. But that's alright because you don't want it to be a cakewalk. A bit of challenge makes it that much more enjoyable. The gadgets that you gain access to are useful for the most part and you can assign up to four of them at a time using the X, square, circle and triangle buttons. The control scheme seems strange at first but it's really easy to get the hang of. Obviously this looks much better than the first game. The detail in the backgrounds is much higher and the polygons don't look so pointy. The levels are bigger but they still kind of feel claustrophobic. This game also has a widescreen option. If you played this game let me know what you think. If you haven't played it then give it a try as it's definitely a good time. This is Zone of the Enders, the second runner. This is a much better game than the first one. As with all Kojima games there's a large complicated storyline with lots of twists all throughout. I won't get into it, but the story is much more mature and way better than the first game. Once again you control the orbital frame Jehudi, but this time you're not a dorky kid. Controlling your orbital frame isn't easy. Every button on the controller is used and then some. Spending time with it you'll get the hang of the controls but it will definitely take time. The camera is what I struggled with the most while playing this game. You do have manual control over it, but damn is it slow. Luckily you have a lock on button which will switch between your enemies while fighting. The missions are much more interesting and way more action packed than the first title. In fact you'll be doing a lot of fighting all throughout your experience so getting the hang of the controls early is quite advantageous. With great looking graphics and lots of cool lighting effects this is a game that you should have in your collection. In fact there's an HD remake of the two games on the PS3. I haven't played it but that might be the way to go if you're interested. ETR reaction gone. Exceeding 75%. All right, we're back, and so far we've covered quite a few PS2 games. Yeah, quite a few, but we still have quite a few to go, so. Yeah, it's an amazing system. There's no way we can cover them all, but we'll do what we can. <laughs> Let's just get back into it. Onimusha is a great series that began on the PS2 and it all started with Onimusha Warlords. You're Samonosuke and you need to rescue the princess who's been kidnapped. 
You do this on the very second screen of the game after defeating the first two enemies. Believe it or not, you haven't beaten the game. She gets kidnapped again. This one's basically a hack and slash version of Resident Evil with demons instead of zombies. In fact, the game began development as a Resident Evil game set in feudal Japan. That explains a lot of the similarities like the tank controls, herbs you find for healing, the game over screen, and a lot of other things. That's okay though, because this game is excellent. You power up your sword with orbs and collect the souls of defeated enemies. You can then use these souls to power up your equipment and your items. The switching camera can get disorienting at times, as can the controls, but it's all good once you get used to them. My biggest complaint would be that fumbling through the menu screen is not as intuitive as it could be, especially when you're just trying to look at your map. It's just too many button presses to get there. But that's really only a minor gripe in an otherwise outstanding package with excellent graphics and perfectly fitting music. If you can't adapt to the controls, find a friend who can and watch them play. Go, Renato! Fight the belly of that maggot and feast upon his bloody flesh! <laughs> This is Oz, over Zenith, or Oz, sort of a Terria depending on your region. This Konami game came out in Japan and Europe, but sadly never in the US, and I don't understand why. Anyway, you play as Feel, a human with strange powers who teams up with two members of Oz who are controlled by the CPU. You're trying to save your little sister Dorothy, who is kidnapped by the gods. Yes, this game is called Oz, and her name is Dorothy. And if that's not enough, your cat's name is Toto. He can fly and even talk. And just like the books and the movie itself, the gameplay mainly consists of juggling enemies back and forth between three characters until they die. This is a very important technique that you need to get used to as quickly as you can. Fortunately, it's not that hard to get the hang of, you just have to listen for when your name is called. When all three of you juggle the same enemy without it hitting the ground, a bar will go up on the right. This allows you to do a special attack. You'll need to do this to break certain items in some stages. It's also very handy for defeating bosses. The more you juggle, the higher your level gets. So if you can get it up to level 2, you and a team member will combine for an even stronger attack. You get the idea. The game may seem kind of repetitive, but personally I found it addictive back when I was playing the Japanese version and I still do now. Though playing the European version here is much nicer because I can read the text in the store where you can upgrade all your characters. The graphics are straight out of Konami's Castlevania PS2 games and that's not a bad thing. The music is awesome as it was done by Mishiru Yamane who did Castlevania Bloodlines on the Genesis and of course Symphony of the Night. This is a really fun game that I'm sad never came out here. This is Sly Cooper in the Thievius Raccoonus. Sly had three games released to the PS2 and this is the first one. Sly, being a raccoon, is of course a master thief. Aided by your two friends Bentley and Murray, you're out to get your family's book back called The Thievius Raccoonus. This incriminating book holds all of your family's greatest thieving moves so it's important that you get it back because, you know, every smart thief keeps track of all their wrongdoings. Sly controls really well and he uses his cane to help him get around. Just like a thief, he's sneaky and doesn't want to be seen. But when you are seen by enemies, it's not bad since they're usually dispatched with one hit. Every level has lots of stuff to collect, and some of it's pretty useful. If you collect the required number of bottles in each level, Bentley the Turtle can decipher a code to allow you to open a safe. These safes have valuable items in them, like pages from your stolen book. Getting these back will teach you new moves to use during gameplay. As you can see, the developers went with a cell shaded look to the graphics. I like this, and I think it turned out really nice. The Sly Cooper games are a great set of titles for the PS2 and one that really helped define the system back in the day. Alright, let's break this episode up a bit and talk about the hotshot sports games from Sony. I've said it once and I'll say it again, I'm not a fan of sports video games. If you look through my collection, it'd be very hard for you to find any, and the ones that you do find will be mainly golf. Speaking of which, let's start out with Hot Shots Golf 3. This is a great pick up and play game. You don't have to invest a lot of time to get a lot of enjoyment out of it. Honestly, I can finish a round of 18 holes in just over 20 minutes and that's exactly how I like it. This game features all the modes you'd find in any other golf game. Tournament mode is where you're going to want to spend most of your time. 
Playing this mode in winning tournaments is how you unlock characters, courses, and a bunch of other items. Controlling your golfer and making good shots is fairly easy once you figure out how to adjust for factors like wind and elevation changes. I like all the courses in these games and they're all imaginary. They have lots of different backgrounds which makes for a lot of variety. There's only one annoying feature. When you're putting in tournament mode, the gallery talks to you and says really stupid stuff like Calm down. It's okay. I was calm until you told me to do so, now please die! Your ball is in proximity to the hole. That's a conceivable birdie. Next in the Hot Shot series is Hot Shots Tennis. Unlike the golf game, which has many entries for each Sony system, Hot Shots Tennis only has two. One on the PS2 and one on the PSP. I'm not sure why, as this is a fun game as well, although it feels a bit more bland. The gameplay is solid and it's accessible for beginners and does get challenging for more experienced players. The first time I played this game, I was able to walk my way right up to the semi-pro level before I lost my first match. There's lots of stuff to unlock and the way to do it is by playing the Hot Shots Challenge mode. If you're lucky enough to have a friend that likes to play video games based on tennis, then there's a variety of modes for multiplayer. There's not much else going on in this game and that's why it's fairly bland. Still, it's super cheap and seriously, you can get it for around $2 and you'll easily get your money's worth for that price. Sega Rally 2006 is the third game in the Sega Rally series. Never put the year in the game title, guys. It dates the game immediately. This one was only released in Japan. You have your arcade mode, which plays similar to the previous games, only it tries to be a bit more faithful to actual rally racing here. There are no laps, and the segments are pretty short, and that means your game is over pretty quickly. The graphics aren't bad, and at least they're in widescreen, but they in no way match up to the rally sports games that preceded this on the Xbox. The music isn't horrible either, but it's different than the last two games for sure. There's also a career mode in case you care about that, and in this game, I really don't. These menus are all in Japanese. But the best part is the bonus disc that contains the original Sega Rally Championship. This was available only with the first printing of the game. It's basically just the arcade version of the original on the PS2. This is pretty cool and runs slightly better than the Saturn version, but unfortunately it's not in progressive scan so it looks a bit half-assed. The music isn't as good as the Saturn version either, but instead it sounds like the arcade version. Honestly, this really makes me appreciate how good the Saturn version actually is. Sega also released a lot of compilations and upgraded games in Japan under the Sega Ages 2500 label. The number refers to the fact that they cost 2500 yen each. Yep, they're budget titles. Some of the compilations are really cool like Sega Ages Volume 30 Galaxy Force 2 Special Extended Edition. This one, for example, lets you play the arcade version of the game, which is the first time it came home in 100% of its audiovisual glory. And I tell you, I'd rather play this on the PS2 than the 3DS any day of the week. It also lets you play the crappy Genesis version and even the Sega Master System version of the game. Each of these games have multiple resolutions to choose from, including 240p, 480i, and 480p. Thank you, Sega, for not forcing crappy 480i on us like the majority of other PS2 games do. There's also Galaxy Force Neo Classic, which is a slightly upgraded version of the arcade which allows you to play in widescreen. This is really cool. This game is a trip to play in widescreen, and I recommend it for sure if you can play imports. Many other compilations exist in Japan, like the Monster World Complete Collection. This has all the Wonder Boy games on it. For example, you can play the arcade version of the first game, or the Master System version, or the Game Gear version, or even the SG-1000 version. So many choices! There's plenty of other Wonder Boy games to play on here as well, and it's one of many great Sega Ages compilations. Many of the Sega Ages 2500 releases were straight up 3D remakes like Afterburner here. Well, actually, Afterburner 2. These are all basically really low-budget polygonal remakes of the original games, and Afterburner here is not one of the better-looking ones. But it plays perfectly fine, I guess. They even did Game Ground. I don't think this one plays as well as the original, but at least the arranged music is amazing.
or how about Fantasy Star Generation 1? This is a great low budget title and it's a really fun remake of the original. I love seeing all the new graphics and hearing the arranged music. Everything moves super fast though. Still, definitely a good time here. There's even Fantasy Star Generation 2, which is of course a remake of the second game. Again, this is mostly a cool remake, but the random battle and counter rate is even more severe in this one. Good luck. They actually did a lot of these 3D remakes and put them on compilations for release outside of the US. Of course, none of the ones that I show and talk about here are on this disc. Man, I could talk about these for multiple more seconds, especially Hokuto no Ken here, but eh, I'm getting bored. Here's Eco, or as I like to call it, Ico. It's an adventure puzzle game starring a little boy with horns who's doomed to die. He finds a wicked queen's daughter who's locked up in a cage. After freeing her, both of them do their best to escape possibly the biggest castle in the history of video games. That's the story, but what I really see is this. The Horde boy is so happy that he found a girl who isn't totally repulsed by his horns that he will not let her go for anything. All through his quest to get her free and home to his house, he guides her through many perils and fights off the queen's evil shadow creatures who try to get her back. He is so in love with this girl that there's many times he drags her by her arms because he's so afraid that she might change her mind about him. In actuality, the game is insanely fun and chock full of great puzzles for you to figure out. You'll do some fighting at times with the black smoke creatures and luckily your 2x4 is enough to kill them. Thankfully for me, the game has way more puzzles than enemy battles. Since the horn boy and the girl don't speak the same language, there's not a lot of dialogue. But every now and again there's a cutscene and these piece the story together nicely. The game looks really good, I think. Sure, it's hazy and a little blurry since it runs in 240p, but it all still looks really nice. A lot of people didn't like this game because you have to worry about two characters. For me, it was fun and a unique experience. Okay, here's four games that we've talked about in previous episodes. They are so integral to the PS2 library that if I didn't mention them in this episode, we'd be skinned alive. The first game is God of War. This new IP for the PS2 took no time at all to hook me. It features a great storyline that revolves around Greek mythology. There's lots of creatures and huge bosses to battle with plenty of quick time events and gore. It has really great set pieces that make for great backgrounds to traverse. The music is solid and it's just an amazing game for the system. See also God of War 2 for more awesomeness. The next game is Okami. This amazing adventure game stars Amaterasu who took the form of a wolf god on her quest to save the land from darkness. Clover Studios did an outstanding job making this game. Most members of this team would eventually go on to form Platinum Games. The graphics are some of the best you'll see on the system with vivid colors that have a watercolor feel to them. Throughout the game you'll learn how to draw different designs with your celestial brush. These will help Amaterasu by not only bringing the land back to life but you can use them to defeat enemies as well. With a storyline that will draw you in and a really good classical Japanese soundtrack, this is a game not to be missed. Next up we have Shadow of the Colossus. This is the adventure of a boy named Wander. He's out to save the life of a girl. Is it his girlfriend? I'm not sure. Of course, the only way you can save her is by killing 16 colossi. These huge beings roam the land freely and it's up to you to find them. Once you do find them, this is where the fun begins. Firstly, you have to figure out how to get on the Colossi. Once you do, you must reach a certain point and stab and kill this thing. You'll then get its life force, which will in turn bring back that one girl. This is truly an amazing gaming experience. There's no enemies to fight besides the Colossi. It's just you roaming the land and figuring out how to take these mountain-sized beings down. This is definitely one of the highlights of the PS2 library, so do yourself a favor and play it. There's also an HD remake of this paired with Eco for the PS3. <laughs> Lastly, here's Gran Turismo 4. This is a racing simulator. You race cars. It looks nice and shiny and even has 1080i HD mode. 
but you can play it in 480p as well. It's nice if you like this kind of stuff. Uh, do you want to add anything more to that, Dave? Uh, no. Okay, let's cover just a couple more games. Suikoden 3, or at least I think that's how it's pronounced, is one of the many RPGs on the system. Now, to be honest, I've heard a lot of bad things about this one, but I'm gonna judge it for myself. You start out by choosing your character. Each character has their own story to play through, but they all intertwine. It's very similar to how Shining Force 3 on the Saturn works with its three different scenarios, except that the PlayStation 2 has AMAZING, amazing DVD, DVD POWER! So you don't need to buy three separate games. As for the story, let's just say there are groups of people with differences and wackiness ensues. The battle system works pretty well. The battles are fast paced and usually don't get annoying. There is one thing that's odd though. You must divide your party into multiple groups of two characters each. Each group is controlled by a single command such as attack, defend, or using runes. I'm not sure why they did this, but I guess it doesn't bother me too much. Of course, you can usually just get away using auto battle if you want to be quick and sloppy about it. The camera usually works fine, but sometimes it seems to have a hard time keeping up. It also makes it difficult to walk in a straight line. This isn't game breaking or anything, but it's annoying. The graphics aren't too bad and generally the game looks fairly nice. The music's good, but it's not as nice as it was in the first game. I haven't had the chance yet to play through part two though. I hear that's the really good one. Still though, this game does make me want to keep playing and sink hours into it, so I'd say it's not as bad as I've heard. An even better RPG in my opinion is Shadow Hearts by Aruze and Midway. This one is a lot more demonic, but that's okay because hey, who doesn't like demons? They're cute. Anyway, you are Yuri and you're protecting this girl named Alice. She's full of mystery and creepy people seem to really want to get a hold of her. And it's your job to prevent that. This game is really, really good. As a character, Yuri has a lot of his own demons to deal with both figuratively and literally. I like the fact that the gameplay itself isn't super convoluted with mechanics like combining, cooking, or fusing things, or 16 types of magic each requiring special attention and knowledge and all that stuff which overdesigned games love to have. The battle system is cool with its timing attacks. You basically have to press the button as the needle spins around the wheel. The better your timing, the more effective your attack is. The battles are random, but they don't appear often enough to be too annoying. Overall though, the game is a lot of fun to play. The story is actually interesting and the music is fantastic as well. I definitely recommend this one and it even got two sequels on the system. All right, there's a nice little look at the PS2 for you. Um, little as in 45 minutes little. A little, yeah, exactly. But you know, considering there's almost 4,000 games in the library, we're obviously gonna forget a lot. We totally forgot, or we just couldn't include them. Yeah, and that's probably more the reason. But, 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 but enough of that. What is your favorite game on the PS2 or favorite set of games? Because there are a ton of games. It's a fan. Mm -hmm fantastic system yeah yeah definitely tell us we'd like to know uh, maybe there's something out there we haven't played since there's so many games there that oh, maybe I we should know about guarantee it yeah. yeah anyway what do you guys think of the system and in the meantime thank you for watching game sack Heads up, heads up, the PS2 is in town and I have over 3,000 games. I'm the baddest boy in video gaming. I'm the Sega Genesis and I disagree. Is that so? Well, I've got Suck'em US Navy Seals. Well, I've got Green Dog. That ain't nothing compared to Kingdom Hearts 2. Green Dog. Uh, I've, I've got Ridge Racer 5. Green Dog. I, I wish I had Green Dog. Yeah, green dog. <laughs>